Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Because they've seen your compassion, because they've seen your integrity, because they they see you as a genuine Christian, they're going to think, if I can just get next to him or her, if I can just touch them because they're touching the Lord. And, and truly, it's our opportunity to make it clear to them, listen, the Lord's there for you too. Part 4 in the final part of Pastor Sam's message, The Great Physician. A wonderful declaration of Jesus' power, heart, and compassion. Today we look at Matthew 9 starting in verse 18 and closing out the chapter. Miracle healings, resurrections from the dead, and casting out of demons. It's all here. Let's listen in. In any case, here's this ruler, comes to the Lord, worships him, says, my daughter, man, she's gone, but I know that if you'll come lay your hands on her, she'll live. Hey, that is great faith. That's radical faith, and it's rightly placed. It's all about him. Now, I love that the Lord didn't say, well, haven't you heard what happened with the centurion? I mean, I could do this from here. The Lord just graciously meets with people right where they're at. We need to do that same thing. Not be quick to correct them or say, well, look at this. But just to say, yes, I'll meet that. I'll do that. I'll tend to that. Well, this woman comes up, verse 20, who'd had a flow of blood for 12 years. She came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Now, get this. One guy says, if he'll just touch my daughter, she'll be healed. This gal says, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be healed. Now, Matthew doesn't give us all of the details on any of this, but, but let me fill in just a couple blanks. Both Mark and Luke tell us that this gal had spent all that she had in an attempt to be made well. Now, Mark tells us she spent it all and got worse. Luke, who's a physician, doesn't point out got worse because, well, you know, a little physician's pride there. But, but he does acknowledge she'd spent all her money on physicians and none could help her. Her situation was devastating for a variety of reasons. She was ceremonially defiled. That meant she was a social outcast. She was a spiritual outcast. And we know that, that she was struggling financially because she'd spent everything she had trying to get better so she could socialize and, and function spiritually. Go to the feast. Go to the celebrations. So here she is. And, and she truly is as desperate as this father. He desperate for his daughter. She desperate just to get her life back. Twelve years of suffering, of desperation. And so she comes to this conclusion, if I can just touch that which is touching him, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made whole. I want to tell you that for us, those of us who walk with the Lord, who represent the Lord, who people are watching, they know we're Christians, they actually believe this same thing. And, and oftentimes it, it takes some time to come to the conclusion. But, but here's what happens. They know you're a Christian and maybe they even make a little fun of you or try to get you to do things you're not supposed to do, mess with you. But in their time of trial, of temptation or of desperation, they will come. And because they know you're for real because they've seen your compassion, because they've seen your integrity, because they, they see you as a genuine Christian, they're going to think, if I can just get next to him or her, if I can just touch them because they're touching the Lord. And, and truly, it's our opportunity to make it clear to them, listen, the Lord's there for you too. I don't think many unbelievers get that. I don't think many backsliders believe it. They think that the Lord's blessing us because of how good we are. Now, we know better. We know it's his grace. We know it's his mercy. But the bottom line is, God's just being good to us because God is good. And we need to let them know, listen, I'm so glad you came. And I want you to connect with the one who really can make a difference, who really can do something. Yes, I'll pray for you. Yes, I'll be praying for you. But, but it's Jesus they've got to connect to. And, and, and that's what I see here. She's like, if I can just connect with something connected to Jesus, that will do. And, and it's, though it may be minorly misplaced or imperfect, the idea being is, 
I'm going to get close enough to Jesus for his power to touch me and make a difference and to heal me. Now, we're not told here in Matthew's account again that after she did touch him, Jesus said, who touched me? She had cowered away. She was hiding in the crowd. The disciples are a little perturbed, no doubt, by this question. It's like, what? Who touched you? We're mobbed here. Are you joking, Lord? But but here's what he's saying. No, I'm not asking who bumped into me. I'm saying who took hold of me? Who touched me? Why? He said, I felt power. I felt power go forth from me. Now, I don't believe that just happened and Jesus was like, oh, wow, that was trippy, you know. Power went through me. No, I think he knew that she touched him and understood why and he met her in a spiritual, very real and physically healing way. But but my point is, what he wants to do is draw her out. Now, he could have easily figured it out. But what he's trying to do is draw her out. So he says, who touched me? Power went forth. She comes out of the crowd and and, and says, Lord, it was me. And, And what happens is he pulls her out because when the Lord does touch you, when the Lord does meet you in your time of desperation or your point of extremity, listen, he wants you to testify to it. That's why he told the the demon-possessed man there on Gadara, when he said, let me go with you, he said, no, go home and tell him what great things God has done for you. And he wants us to do the same. When he touches us, when he blesses us, when he heals us, when he comforts us, he wants us to bear witness to that reality. And he calls us out to do it. He gives us opportunity to do it. By the way, that's why after the invitation, and we give one at every service, an opportunity for you, if you haven't yet given your life to the Lord, for you to to take that step, to pray that prayer, to to say, Lord, I'm a guilty sinner. You're a holy God. I I see my sins separating us. I want to know you. I want to know your forgiveness. I want to be close to you. I want to be transformed by you, useful to you, glorifying to you. Lord, come into my life. When we do that afterward, we always ask you to come down and to stand here. Now, people don't always take advantage of that. And I get that. Took my wife months of going to church with Greg Laurie, amazing evangelist, and we're there week after week after week. And finally, she just couldn't keep herself anymore. And she raised her hand and she went down. And and it's and I know that that's a big thing for a lot of people. Hey, It's one thing to in private with every head bowed and eyes closed, pray and say, Jesus, touch me, change me, forgive me, heal me. It's another thing to stand up in front of people and say, hey, God has touched my life. He's transformed my life. He's he's given me life. But see, that's for your benefit and the benefit of all the people around. That's why he called her out. And that's why he calls us out. Well, In the midst of all of this, he tells her, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And we see in every instance, except those two again, that faith was placed in him. Even though she was like, well, just the hem of the garment. That was close enough. That was good enough for her. And God honored it. She was made well from that hour. Well, he comes to the ruler's house then having sandwiched this miracle in between the introduction and the the culmination of this other miracle, he comes to the ruler's house. There are these flute players and noisy crowds wailing. They actually had professional mourners in that culture in that day. It's hard for us to really get a handle on a, to get a you know, it just seems weird to me after all these years of reading it and understanding it. But they would hire people and they would come and weep and wail and mourn. And so they're there. Why? Because this little gal has died. And then Jesus says, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. Now, don't misunderstand this term sleeping. It is never used in the scripture of the soul. It is never used of the consciousness. It is only used of the body. And the reason for that being, well, a body that's sleeping and a body that's dead, they look very much alike. The only real difference being that the dead body, well, no breath, no pulse, no heartbeat. And so I'm not saying that's a minor difference. It's significant. But what I am saying is because sleep and death look alike, the Bible uses this euphemism of sleep. But there's another reason Jesus calls it sleep. Because death, even physical death, is a temporary setback. 
We were all created for and fitted for eternity. We have a soul that is going to live forever. We have a consciousness that will exist forever. And the bottom line is, whether you're prepared for it or not, when you die, well, your soul, your consciousness, your fate will be sealed forever. And so, good question, and and probably at this point, do you know if you died today, if you died tonight, would it be true for you as it is for most here, absent from the body, present with the Lord? Or would you be separated from the Lord because you never gave your life to the Lord, because you died in your sins? Here, Here's the deal. Someone, by the way, put in one of those little uh, question sheets, and we get them every week, a lot of them. We appreciate them, but, but here's a tip. If you're going to ask a question, write your name and number on it. Here's why. Unless it comes up in the study, I really can't take a few minutes, and it would be a few every study, to just answer the questions, though that would be probably you know beneficial at some point. But the question had to do with, well, what's the deal with absent from the body and present with the Lord? Then, then what's the point of the resurrection? Or what's the resurrection? Well... The resurrection is physical to answer the question. Next time, though, I would have answered it anyway because it's in the text. But but here's the deal. I don't know why. I only know what. Some try to explain the why of the resurrection. I just know the Lord says that's what he intends to do. And that's what he's going to do. But you need to know if you're a believer, the moment you die... You, your soul, your consciousness, the real you that's living inside this body, not mine, yours, living inside your body is going to be with the Lord and your body will be buried. And then at the resurrection, your body will be resurrected. Why? I don't know, because the Lord decided that's what he wanted to do, you see. And he gives us pictures of this throughout scripture. His own resurrection was physical and bodily. And um, every resurrection will, before that, of course, same deal. And so our resurrection will be physical. It will be our body. It will be um, that body transformed, of course, into a body fit for eternity, fit for heaven. But you will be either with the Lord or separated from the Lord. And the truth is right now, as we're meeting, as we're considering God's word, you're already in one of those two states. You're either with the Lord your, your citizenship in heaven, you've already been born again and you're adopted into the family, you're, you're his child, or you're separated from him and in need of his forgiveness and in need to give your life to him. Because if you die without Jesus, you will die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you won't be in that first resurrection. You won't be there with us in heaven. You will be separated from God for eternity. And the worst of it is you'll be conscious and aware and tormented, not just by the mistakes you made in your life, but by the fact that you had opportunity to to say, forgive me and and, and come, oh, Lord, you know, I want to give you my life. Well, in any case... He removes everyone from the room but her parents. We know this from the other Gospels. Peter, James, and John were with them as well. And then he touches her and he speaks to her. And listen, only Jesus could speak to the dead and have them rise up. She wasn't in a coma. She wasn't just sleeping. She was dead. And he raises her from the dead. And then very practically, he says, hey, Give her something to eat. I love that. It's, it's sort of a, a side note in just one of the other Gospels. But he says, give her something to eat. Why? Because she was truly alive and because she needed nourishment. There's a, a beautiful spiritual parallel. Those who've come to Christ in, in the past weeks and months and are just starting to get going in the Bible. Listen, make sure you make it a daily priority to read the Word of God. Why? It's the only spiritual nourishment available on this planet. And and as much as you're in the word, you'll grow. As much as you obey the word, you'll be healthy and sound and, and exercise your faith. Well, make room, he says. And then putting the crowd outside, he takes her by the hand. We know from the other gospels, he speaks to her. The girl arose and the report went out into all the land. Now, having departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, Have mercy on us. Son of David, a messianic title. And uh, Jesus, of course, realizes that they're referring to him as the Messiah here. And so he just kind of keeps walking. You got to really, you know, just look at the text and you'll see that. They're crying out. 
he's walking on, but once he's in the house, they come to him there in the house, and he addresses their need. Why didn't he do it publicly? Well, I believe simply because they were heralding him as the Messiah. And you need to know that those who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah saw him as a political leader. That's why the religious establishment had so many problems. They thought the Messiah was going to crush the Roman rule and establish the kingdom of God on earth. Well, that's going to happen still. The Lord is going to return and he is going to rule and reign over this planet. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will reign forever and rule forever. But but here, what's happening is they cry out, they cry out, have mercy on us. And having come to the house, they came to him. And Jesus said, do you believe I am able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. Jesus sternly warned them saying, see, see that no one knows it. And when they departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. Now, a couple of things. First of all, they call him Lord. He says, don't tell anybody. They go out and they tell everybody. I don't know. It's like, why do you tell me, Lord, call me Lord, Lord, he says, and not do what I say. But they were just so blessed and blown away and excited they couldn't contain themselves. His reason, by the way, again, for telling them keep this quiet was on that side in the Capernaum region. He already had a lot of crowds gathering around. He wasn't trying to, to cause an uproar. He was trying to minister the word and, and minister to people's physical needs. And to share the gospel. We'll see that here in a moment. There's something else, though. We mentioned that there was no pattern or formula that could be established for how God would work in an individual life. But we did see that in seven of the nine cases, faith was exercised directly in him. That's so important. Again, I couldn't overemphasize that faith has got to be in him for it to be effective. But there's something else, and that is a lot of people believe that it is the amount of faith. You know, if I just had more faith than he, well, my faith's in him, but he's not doing what I want. So if I had more faith, he'd have to do what I want. No, he'll still do what he wants. Why? Because he's the Lord. And that's what a lot of people are missing today. They're, they're like, if I just believe it hard enough, look, no matter how hard you believe, if it's not true or not right or not best, because... He is a loving, all-knowing, all-powerful Father and God. He's going to do the right thing. And, and so here they say, you know, he says, do you believe I'm able? Yes. And then according to your faith, let it be to you. I think one of the translations I read said in proportion to your faith. It sort of brought brought to mind that idea of, well, how, if I have enough faith, it's going to happen. And, and I was thinking, what happens if you really think through how people believe? If if one of these guys had a lot of faith, he'd be 2020 and the other guy be like 2010 or 2040, you know, but he doesn't say that it's not in proportion to your faith. That's how healed you'll be. No, as a result of your faith. And putting it in me, hey, it was going to be 2020 for both guys. And these guys who came in blind left seeing. Well, having departed and spread the news, it brings us to this final miracle of these nine. As he went out, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke, the multitudes marveled, saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said he cast out demons by the rulers of the demons. Three very important things. We know that oftentimes demon possession did affect people physically. Why? The demons had control of them completely. They're on Gadara. The demons actually spoke through the man they were possessing. They had control of his vocal cords so that they could speak through him. Here, this guy, they have control of his vocal cords and they keep him from being able to speak. But when the demon is cast out, the man is able to speak. Now, what we don't want to assume from this or the conclusion we don't want to make from this is that all the physical maladies were demon-inspired or, or a result of demon activity. No, there are just regular sicknesses and sorrows on this planet well aside from the spiritual realm. And uh, all of us are going to deal with those in some measure. But in this guy's case... And again, we don't see if the Lord spoke or touched. All we know 
is that he cast out the demon, doesn't even tell us how, but having cast him out, the man was able to speak. The two other things, the multitudes marveled. That was often the response of the people that were watching Jesus work, as it would be for us. We'd be blown away, marveling completely if such a thing happened in our midst. But note this, the religious leaders who should have known, hey, they knew the scriptures, they knew the prophecies, they knew what Messiah was prophesied to do, and Jesus was doing it all. They, instead of believing, said, well, this is the work of the devil. He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. This, by the way, is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you've heard the term, or if you've worried, oh, I wonder if I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. No, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is attributing the work of God to Satan. It's attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to the unholy spirit. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're saying, oh, he's just in league with Satan. That's how he's able to do this stuff. It's a completely ridiculous and wrong assumption and really made because they just didn't want to budge in their opposition to him, their growing hostility toward him. The Pharisee says he cast out demons by the rulers of the demons. Well, Jesus will deal with that issue further in. But we conclude with the latter part of the chapter. This will actually be the beginning of our next study. But I want you to see that the three things that Jesus, well, They sort of summarize his ministry. And then there's a practical exhortation to us as well as them to be praying for something very specific and important. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Teaching the word, preaching the gospel, healing the sick. That is the ministry of our Lord In summary, and you find him throughout the Gospels doing those things. It's what he's still doing. Teaching his word, does it through people. And anybody willing to open the word and say, hey, let's look into the word. God will still teach us. He'll still teach you. He's teaching. His gospel still going forth. And he's still the one doing the healing. Then it says, When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. That's my prayer for us that we would be moved with compassion toward the people around us, especially those who are in desperate situations, that they could sense our care, our love, and that that would build a bridge to them in their time of need so we could introduce them to the one who can actually meet their every need, the one who loves them so much he laid down his life for them, died for their sins as he did ours, was buried and rose again. He saw them as they really are, weary and scattered, not a nuisance, not a problem. No, weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. And then he gives very clear instruction. I believe this applies here today. He he says the harvest is plentiful. You know, I believe that about Chico. I've been here almost 20 years. and, And some of the other pastors who are in this town have been here as long as me, lots much shorter time, but praying the whole time for our community and the surrounding communities. And I believe the harvest is plentiful. And I believe as it was in that day, the laborers are few. But here's the deal. We don't want to just pray, Lord, send another half a dozen out. No, we want to pray that the Lord will use each and every one of us in his work. And we'll talk more about that next time. We'll pray the Lord of the harvest. We will to send out laborers into his harvest. Truly the harvest is plentiful. So many lost sheep out there not knowing where to turn. Many of them not nearly as concerned about their eternal destination as they are concerned about how they're just going to survive today. Now Jesus has given us the privilege to be part of this harvest. He has given each of us the ability to help meet some of their needs and given all who know him a story to share with the lost. And we can begin with those who exist within our own circles of influence. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.